are here now to also honor the many men and women who have been helping us advance the science all over the country that we all benefit from. It's taken an extraordinary level of public private sector collaboration, coupled with around the clock efforts of the scientific community to get us to where we are today. And while the race for the vaccine has been on, researchers were also working effortlessly to identify treatments that were going to help reduce the severity of the disease and prevent hospitalizations and ultimately death. There have been countless of clinical trials that have led to the effective treatments that we see today and that we are going to continue to see moving forward. Our honoree in the innovation and research category was one of the many scientists who worked towards these life-saving treatments. Dr. Alina Baum is the Associate Director in Infectious Disease at Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, where she is currently leading the COVID-19 spike antibody program. Her work centered around the development of an antibody cocktail that effectively attacks the spike protein of the virus and reduces the severity of patient symptoms. Alina also leads a virology research group developing novel therapies for other viral infections, including Ebola, as well as emerging infections, as well as therapeutic vaccines for cancer immunotherapy. Alina, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So, Lena, you know, you've just heard the last conversation, and we all appreciate hearing from you, like, what it was like being you for the last couple of years. You know, let's start by, describe for us what were those moments, like I said, that you realized this wasn't a drill. This may be one of the biggest moments of your life where science could have the impact it can truly have to transform lives. Yeah. What was this a sense for where were you and what was in your mind? Mm -hmm. it, it's been an incredible experience overall. I think like everybody in the world where we, and I'm, I'm a virologist by training. So I've been working with viruses for, um, for decades now, never imagining this type of a real world scenario. So where we were in end of December, beginning of January is we, like, like the rest of the world, we were seeing these news reports coming out of China. We really didn't know if this was going to be a big issue or not. And what, what happened, I remember these vivid moments of conversations that happened in the beginning of January. I was talking to my boss, Christos Karatsis at Regeneron, and we were saying, okay, we have now the sequence of the spike protein. We got the sequence was the first thing. Let's just go ahead and start working on this. Even if this virus really doesn't spread, maybe it disappears. We're going to start working on this because we have a commitment to pandemic response. We have this whole rapid response program at Regeneron. We just got our first Ebola therapeutic approved right before at the end of, um, or not, it wasn't even approved yet. We just submitted our application at the end of 2019. So we were set up to do this. We started working in the middle of January, and I think over the course of like one week, maybe 10 days, it went from, hey, let's do this, to priority number one for the company. We're now in this, um, what we call super, you know, super rocket speed mode, uh, because we just started seeing the cases go up, and we started seeing cases outside of China, and I think then, you know, you kind of make some assumptions again, as a virologist, you understand that this is going to be a virus that transmits fairly easily, that people are infected and not getting diagnosed. So it was becoming more and more obvious from the beginning to the end of January. So by the end of January, we were already in this mode where the whole company is aligned that this is our number one priority. Um, and from that time, and again, new virus, there are no reagents, no tools, there's nothing known, there are no papers, right? So how do you make a therapeutic when there's no, essentially no knowledge in what you're working on? And I think at that point is where um, the, the academic community was really, really crucial because we started seeing these preprints coming from all these different labs around the world, providing really important data on SARS-CoV-2 on the spike protein, on the sequence, on the structure, and 
by having that data and then also having a lot of background in our company where we have um, an infectious disease group, we have virologists with a lot of expertise, we put these things together, allowed us to move extremely quickly. So from January until April, we were in this mode where we're looking for antibodies to pick and move forward into the clinic. and. I also, you know, these memories that you kind of have that you'll probably keep forever. I remember we came here, it's, we're in New York, um, came into the lab on a Saturday in the middle of March um, because that was the day when really critical data was coming. That was our first peak yeah. at knowing whether we were gonna get antibodies that looked good enough to actually move forward into the clinic. So we gather here on a Saturday, you know, one of the um, people from who works in the lab is sitting at the computer, read, looking at the data, our CSO, Georgian Kopoulos, comes in. We're all staring at the data, and we see that we have what we're looking for. And, and it, it, you know, again, it's like this moment we're like, yes, we got this first step. Now we can move on to the next steps. We had our champagne, and then we moved on. Wow. And by the middle of April, we started manufacturing for our clinical studies. The clinical studies started in June. Um, but then, the you know, again, you're doing all this kind of hoping that it's gonna work based on all the data, you know, the knowledge of virology and everything, but you don't really know. Um, and the other moment that was really, really important is on, again, it was a Saturday in September. There were a lot of Saturdays. <laughs> a lot of Saturdays. In the lab. <laughs> yeah, Saturday in September, um, I got a call from my boss again saying, you know, we got data from the clinical study. It looks like the drug works. And I think until then, you're kind of holding your breath. Right. You're hoping, uh, but you don't know what's gonna happen. And remember, this was when we were here in the spring in New York, it was, it was a really scary, scary time to be in New York. Um, people kept coming into the lab, kept doing their jobs um, because it, it was kind of just, we just felt like this is what we had to do. Um, and so it's, it's been, you know, almost two years now, and it's been a real uh, rewarding, exhausting, um, but really important uh, time for us. And, you know, we feel like we've really done something meaningful. Alina, just like it sounds like both Peter and Matt were remarking on, you know, the idea of speed without compromising quality and scientific rigor um, was so critical for you all. But you know, it wasn't as if Regeneron didn't have enough on its plate. Like, what was it like to know that all the priorities all of a sudden have shifted? Like, it, what was it, that level of leadership? What yeah. did that have to look like? In some way, it makes things extremely easy. And I think the, the spirit of Regeneron is such that once that decision is made by by our leadership again, which is you know Georgia and Coppolis Lynch Schleifer really, and they say, okay, we're all in. It, everything then seamlessly comes together because if everyone agrees this is the number one priority, this is the number one priority. So I think that was really important, and that happened really early. That that happened in January, so there was really no. It was all about how are we going to do this and how are you going to do each step and, and not necessarily are we going to do this or are we not going to do this. The other thing that was absolutely critical for us is that even though SARS-CoV-2 was new, these we've done this type of stuff before. So we've had this Ebola program where we kind of went through all the steps. How do you do rapid response? How do you shrink this time between discovery and manufacturing? Um, and a lot of that has been improved over time. So there was a lot of expertise built over the years that we could tap into, again, almost seamlessly without having to, um, you know, really invent those pieces and move very fast into clinical studies. Alina, I, I appreciate you're the, you're the voice of all of the scientists that have worked around the clock for, for so many months, weeks, Mm -hmm. now that have made sort of all of our lives possible to get back to normal. You hear it from every patient community at this point. When, am, when are we going to get the COVID-19 treatment? If, there's, if there is a, a lesson learned in the last couple of years that you want to share with the American public for how research works, what would that be? What was the magic that we were able to unlock? And what could we reasonably expect moving forward? I think 
the lesson is that you have to invest in things before um, there's an emergency. And, and that's a lesson for, um, you know, not just for science, I think it's for logistics, how you, how, you, how you communicate, how you really, you know, get things done that you want to be done. Um, we have to invest in different types of modalities, you know, vaccines, but therapeutics are also important. And we're starting to see that now that, you know, obviously vaccines are essential and, and for public health, they're incredibly important. But your need for some people, you will need protection with different types of modalities. You have to invest in all of these things up front. And I think that's the real lesson for the next pandemic because the next virus is out there. It's gonna come out, it's gonna happen. And how we react to it is really gonna depend on what we put in place um, based on, on the lessons that we're learning now. I do think that overall, we've been extremely successful. I think what we've been able to do in less than two years is kind of mind blowing. And sometimes we are, you know, we're, we're working so much, you kind of lose track of the, the big picture because on the day, to, you're always in the day to day and you were so busy and, you know, you just kind of keep working and keep working. But when you step away from it and think about what we've been able to achieve, um, like having a tube of DNA and now we've treated over millions of individuals with our drug less than two years into the process, it's incredible. So you have to take those lessons, apply to the next thing, but also invest in being more prepared such that you're not waiting months before you start clinical trials, right? And you can do these things right off the bat. And it obviously could have saved um, many, many lives, and, you know, maybe millions of lives. Um, so the, I think that that's the, the key thing is for people to keep realizing that this is not something that we can just be done with and then move on. We have to, we have to be prepared for what comes next. Well, Lena, I know I speak for everyone and thanking you and the scientific community on a, as a whole for everything that's been done. And in addition to pausing to celebrate what's been accomplished, you know, one of the things that your work inspired is many, many, many young people, including my daughter, that every time she gets asked to write a science paper or a science project, it's about becoming an epidemiologist or a scientist it's battling a virus. and capturing the imagination of our young people to follow in your steps in pursuing science is a noble career path for making a difference in the world. So thank you again, Alina, for your time today and celebrating you and the accomplishments of the community as a whole. Thank you so much. Thank you. So after a quick five minute intermission, we're gonna be joined by the chair of the board of the Alliance for Health Policy, Dr. Reed Tuxen, will be moderating the next two sessions, honoring those that have been working in their communities and in public health. So be sure to click the community engagement in public health in the right sidebar to join that discussion. And thank you all for allowing me to moderate the, last, the first two sessions of our event today.